Sometimes I feel like we're living in an era of remakes, where everything that was once good and popular is destined to be resurrected so that someone, somewhere, can squeeze out whatever monetary value they can from its name, legacy, or fanbase. Nostalgia is a commodity, and I guess it makes sense that no one who's sitting on something valuable wants to let it go to waste. So they don't. This is true for movies, cartoons, TV shows, and goddamn is it true for video games. The past decade has seen the number of re-releases, remasters and reboots all increase, and the past couple of years have seen big budget remakes take up an ever larger role in the gaming market. So it's no surprise at all that Final Fantasy VII, one of the most popular and influential games ever made, would get made again. It was always going to happen. Ever since the PlayStation 3 tech demo showed the recreated opening cutscene at E3 2005 and put the idea at the forefront of fans' minds. People wanted it, and with time their desire for a remake grew right alongside their nostalgia for the original. And sales were pretty much guaranteed. After all, Final Fantasy VII was a game that broke sales records for its time, and its reputation and brand recognition have only increased since. So it almost had to happen. All that's left were the questions of when and how. So fast forward to 2015, where it became official, and this was how people reacted. That is 27 seconds of a 7 hour video, but I feel like those 27 seconds might be all you need. So what is the point of a remake? Well, I guess to give fans what they want, but when it comes to Final Fantasy VII, I'm a fan. This is a game I've completed many times. I've played it as a child, as a teenager, and as an adult. I've played the spin-off games and watched the spin-off movies and animes. Around 2006 to 2008, I spent many hours discussing this game and others on an online Final Fantasy message board, which looking back isn't exactly the coolest thing I've done in my life, but I'm really not sure I'd actually be here making YouTube videos otherwise, so it still stands out as something important that was largely centred around Final Fantasy VII. And I don't want to go into too much detail about my backstory, but the point is, I am a fan. I don't have a list of my all-time favourite or greatest games, but if I did, Final Fantasy VII would easily find a place towards the very top. I am a fan. And I didn't want this. I didn't want it in 2005, I didn't want it in 2010, and I didn't want it in 2015. And don't get me wrong, I wasn't radically opposed to the idea. I understood why so many people wanted a Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I accepted it. But I wasn't one of them. Because I loved Final Fantasy VII. This Final Fantasy VII, my Final Fantasy VII, and I didn't feel a need for it to be remade because I loved it how it was. It's not perfect. It was never perfect, not in 1997 and certainly not today, but I didn't care because when people love something they don't need it to be perfect. It was a classic, an era-defining epic which in spite of its graphics still retained a timeless sense of charm and adventure that resonates to this day. So why would you want more than that? Expecting extra is greedy. How much can one game give? And it's foolish to think it's as simple as updating the graphics. As if a game can just be transcribed one for one, from this to this, without losing something in the process, something which matters, a part of what makes it what it is. Final Fantasy VII was too good to just be remade, the gap in time was too long, the process too complex, and the track record for those in charge too shaky. To think otherwise was hubris. But people did think otherwise. I mean, just listen to them. So 
So I didn't want a remake because I loved this game, but these guys, they loved Final Fantasy VII too. So what sets us apart? Well, I like to use the never controversial example of religion. You see, I've often seen people compare fandoms to religions, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But people usually make this comparison to draw attention to the exaggerated nature of fan reactions and how fandoms seem to worship their franchises with a level of zeal and fanaticism. But I've always liked this comparison for a different reason, which is to do with faith. That's the difference between someone who's religious and someone who isn't in my eyes, and you can try to bring in facts and science and morality and anything else into the equation, but it's unlikely to make a difference because at the heart of the matter it all comes down to faith. You either have it, or you don't. And I think fandoms are the same way. Either you have faith, like all these guys do, or like me, you don't. So that's where I was going into the Final Fantasy VII Remake. I was a fan who lacked faith, going into the experience with modest expectations, which might give me a different perspective to many other people, but I want you to understand what perspective I had and where it came from. And the question of faith, and the purpose of a remake, and the era we find ourselves in, are all things I'm going to come back to, but for now, what about the game itself? Well, welcome to 2020, where the remake is finally here. The moment where people's dreams become reality, and people realise that dreams are complex and elusive things that are always outside of our control. But before going any further, I want to make it clear that this video will contain some spoilers for both Final Fantasy VII and its remake, and I feel it's only fair to point out to people that just because you're familiar with one of these games doesn't mean that spoilers for the other won't matter. And with that, let's get back to Midgar. It's a strange feeling to see something so familiar, yet so different. The opening cutscene of the remake contains an almost shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the PlayStation 1 original, and with 23 years of technological improvement, Midgar has never looked better. This cutscene is almost three times as long as the original, with a substantial two minutes of new added footage at the beginning that shows a rare glimpse into normal Midgar life, while cleverly using music, lighting and symbolic imagery to dial up the sense of foreboding. The midway transition from the glow of the Marco reactor into the night sky of the original opening and back into Aerith kneeling in the alleyway feels particularly impressive. Say what you like about Square, they sure do know how to make a nice looking opening, and here, in this new and improved cinematic, we get to see the true ideal of a remake in all its usually unattainable perfection. As in, this cutscene features every single part of the original, remade to look hundreds of times better, with new added footage that matches and complements what was already there, and is blended together seamlessly. If every part of every remake lived up to the standard set by Final Fantasy VII's opening cutscene, well, no one would ever complain about a remake again. Alas, things aren't always this easy, and gameplay presents very different challenges to a static cinematic. Like many JRPGs of its time, the original Final Fantasy VII featured turn-based battles through random encounters amidst navigating pre-rendered backgrounds. But the idea of turn-based battles and random encounters has proven to be too old school for Square Enix since as early as 2006. It makes sense in a way because the Final Fantasy series built its reputation on being an epic cinematic adventure that was at the forefront of technological advancement, and a core gameplay system that developed a reputation as dated as far back as the early 2000s simply clashed with everything the series was marketed as being about. So the old battle system had to go, and ever since the entire series has felt like it's been in a bit of a perpetual identity crisis with its gameplay while other JRPGs found success by either staying true to their turn-based roots, or by embracing the modern action RPG trend, Final Fantasy was instead too proud for either of those choices. It wanted to have its cake and eat it. It wanted to be both modern in appearance, with the feel of an action game, while also retaining its traditional tactical style and strategic sensibilities. And so, each new big-budget Final Fantasy tried to do this in their own way, 
and they didn't do a bad job, but none of them found a formula that proved popular enough to endure. None of them got that mix of old and new quite right, none of them found the right foundation for what modern Final Fantasy wanted to be. Until now. I don't think Final Fantasy VII Remake's combat excels at either of the things it tries to be. As an action game it can't compare to an actual action game, or even some good action RPGs. Combat can come across as visually cluttered and messy, dodging feels a little too ineffective and unsatisfying, targeting enemies is sometimes inconsistent, with aerial foes proving to be particularly annoying, and stopping in the midst of battle to open up a menu to issue out orders kills the flow and the feel of the action. And at the same time, it's tactically simplistic, with only a fraction of the depth of a true turn-based game and teammate AI that's so lacking in customizable behavior or common sense that being forced to take time out of your busy battle schedule to tell them to actually do something feels a bit more like being a babysitter than getting a chance to flex your tactical muscles. But the original Final Fantasy VII wasn't tactically complex to begin with. In fact, none of the older Final Fantasies were. They did just about enough to meet a minimal level of engagingness, while combining that with, for their time, good graphics, and addictive progression systems. This formula was then topped off with plenty of memorable boss fights and story moments that more than made up for any mediocrity in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And I don't think Remake is that different. In fact, when it comes to boss fights, I honestly think this might be the best the series has ever been. There are 28 boss fights in the main game, and none of them feel low effort. These fights are varied, their visual designs look great, their moveset will force players to engage with the game's systems beyond just mashing the attack button, and they simply do a good job at feeling epic. When the gameplay in boss fights does sometimes lag behind, the pure spectacle of these engagements are still there to slap the player in the face so they don't forget to have a good time. And as strong as the spectacle of these fights can be, they still feel like something which you're actively playing through, as opposed to something like Final Fantasy XV, which also has moments of incredible spectacle but falls into the trap of creating experiences that feel more like interactive cutscenes than true boss fights. But Remake gets this just right, and the sheer number of great boss fights in this game is really impressive. There are things to complain about, like boss fights resetting their stagger meter when they change phase, and I'm sure there are more valid criticisms of the combat itself, but overall I like this hybrid combat action system quite a lot. And more so than almost any other JRPG I've played, it really does feel like a modern take on the traditional turn-based combat that so many people, including me, have fond memories of. The materia system is also well implemented, although there aren't as many cool late game combos and synergies as the original game had, and levelling up materia doesn't quite feel as important as it once did. It also needs to be said that the vast quantity of items you pick up, combined with the very generous number of benches you can rest at to be fully healed, is complete overkill. I understand hard mode does take the opposite approach, but I still feel the base difficulty would have felt a bit more satisfying if the number of healing items and benches was toned down by quite a few degrees. But overall, there's a lot more good than bad with the new combat, and the differences between how each of the main characters plays does a lot to keep this solid foundation interesting for the game's duration. And so, it's easy to adapt an opening cutscene, anyone can take years of technological progress and make a cinematic better, but the combat system is a whole other story, and this is a damn fine attempt at building on and modernising the original game. Of course, there are things even more important than combat to a Final Fantasy game, and one thing I was sure the remake wouldn't get right was the characters. Now, before we get into this, I think it might be a good time to flex my Microsoft Paint skills a bit and start things off with an introductory diagram. So, here we have an original idea. It exists inside someone's head, and it's perfect. This will then need to leave someone's head to be turned into a thing, and that will change it slightly. It's now less perfect, but that's the price you pay for creation. A person, like me, will then come along and consume that thing, creating their own interpretation, which, again, differs slightly. 
but other people consume that thing too, and they have slightly different interpretations, and then if they remake the original thing, it comes from their collective interpretations, and it changes again. And then along comes our consumer, who then interprets the new thing. And maybe you can see the problem, but if not, here's a big arrow to draw attention to it. So the point is this. In each arrow, the original idea changes slightly to become something new. So the more arrows, the more it changes, and this can cause a big difference between the way the original seems to us and the way the remade thing seems, which can be a problem. This is, of course, a simplification of what really happens, but I still think this process plays an important role in remakes, particularly when it comes to characters. In a story like Final Fantasy VII, the characters and the player's attachment to them play a crucial part in our enjoyment of the game. These characters matter to us. They are the closest any single part of the experience comes to being sacred, the thing that can't be messed with. And so any time we see these characters again, they have to seem like our characters. And this feels particularly relevant in the case of Final Fantasy VII, because this is something the Final Fantasy VII compilation already got wrong. I hate the Final Fantasy VII compilation. Well, maybe hate is a strong word, but... I hate the Final Fantasy VII compilation, and while there are several reasons for that, it's mostly about the characters and how wrong they felt to me. In Advent Children, Cloud is a moody, brooding, generic anime protagonist, and I hate it. And this is a character I should love. An even worse offender was Aerith in Crisis Core. Aerith, who in the original Final Fantasy VII is confident and charming, and a little bit flirty without going full Jesse, and really, just one of the most likeable and seemingly normal characters in the entire game. In Crisis Core, however, she's just weird. Like, every single line she says has this unnatural, awkward style, which I think is meant to play up how innocent or cute she's meant to be, but that's not Aerith. This thing is like some alien pretending to be human, and it's terrible. I mean, come on, Aerith already had to die once, was it really necessary to do this to her legacy too? This is not my cloud. This is not my cloud either. This is not my Sephiroth. This certainly isn't my Aerith, and I'm sure if I spent more time with these fuckboys, I'd have something to say about them too. And this doesn't just make me dislike the Final Fantasy VII compilation, it's worse. It harms my pure and perfect memories, as if these characters are a body of crystal clear water that someone's just dumped a load of mud right in the middle of, and now I can't see them in the same way anymore. They're all murky and advent children-y. Ugh. But here's the real M. Night Shyamalan part of this little story. These characters aren't actually that bad. I mean, really, they're not that different to the originals, but the problem is that we each have our own subjective interpretation of things. It comes down to that big blue arrow, and the dissonance between our two different interpretations of what should be the same thing. So, in summary, characters are important, and characters are fragile. Or maybe it's the fans that are the fragile ones, but either way, there's a real risk that a remake will get the characters slightly wrong in the eyes of the one who matters the most, the player. And even when they are only slightly wrong, that can still have a substantial negative impact. So, with all that said, we get back to Final Fantasy VII Remake, and... The characters are perfect. This is my Aerith. Confident, charming, just a little bit flirty, and an all-round fun party member. And this is the Tifa I remember. The girl next door archetype with a big heart, who's afraid to speak up directly about her feelings for Cloud, or her confusion about Cloud's past. And Barrett seems spot on too. His antagonism with Cloud is still there, and still really prevalent, but the writers make sure not to push it too far to the point where Barrett starts to seem unlikable. His light-hearted comic relief side is here too, but again the writers don't take it far enough so as to undermine his believability as a real character. And his hardline, uncompromising anti-Shinra side is here as well, in all its glory, with the writers very deliberately not pulling any punches to try to sugarcoat his morally questionable extremism. It really is great, 
Barrett comes off as a likeable and flawed character with real depth, and considering how this is a character who's been unfairly criticised for years as just being a cheap Mr. T knockoff, as well as being a character who is a massive terrorist in a now post 9-11 world, it makes it all the more impressive how strong his characterization is here while staying completely faithful. And after seeing Barrett, I honestly can't wait to see how the writers handle Sid, because Sid is a character I thought for sure would be changed or ruined, until I actually played the remake. But now I think they'll do it, I think they'll do Sid justice. Who would have thought? Cloud seems well done too, although it's too early to judge his character fully. But his cool mercenary facade has enough cool in it to endear him to audiences, and the wrongness of his act shines through all the time too, without being so heavy handed that it feels like too much. Best of all though, he feels genuinely relatable. Even if you know why he acts the way he does, his mannerisms and word choice feel just as easily explained by good old run of the mill social awkwardness as anything else. And this results in him feeling very human. It's easy for the player to feel invested in his character, and considering the direction his story will go, that's incredibly important. So the writers seem to understand their characters perfectly, and that cognitive dissonance that I felt so clearly in every other Final Fantasy VII related spin-off is nowhere to be found. These characters are great. The main characters are vastly expanded in terms of the quantity of the dialogue, but they still always seem to retain their original personality. They're also all likeable, and the large amount of sexual tension between them is pretty enjoyable too which is an unusual thing to be able to say about a video game. Dialogue also feels believable, with solid voice acting, and the side characters, both original and returning, are good as well. And so, if I was worried my background as a fan would somehow get in the way of my enjoyment of an otherwise good game, well, I couldn't have been more wrong. There's a simple pleasure in seeing characters you've always loved faithfully brought to life again in an all new and expanded role. And that doesn't just apply to the characters, it's true for every memorable moment, every story scene you know and love, and every little quirk you didn't think would make the cut. Not all of Remake is faithful, but the parts which are have been translated very well. Take the whole of Wall Market, Midgar's sleazy red light district, which is not only visually incredible, but also manages to stick very close to the events of the original game, while adding new interesting characters. And that's not an easy task, because the original wall market section was weird. Like seriously weird, in a you couldn't do that after the 90s kind of way. But here it is, and the parts that matter the most are still here. Such as cloud cross-dressing, which still comes off as absolutely ridiculous in how it's played completely straight, with characters like Tifa being apparently unable to recognise him until he speaks. Like, come on, how do people not recognise that hair? This shouldn't work in modern graphics, but it still does. Then you have Don Corneo, the cartoonish crime lord who combines rapiness with comic relief. And that doesn't sound like a winning combination in 2020, but this character still works perfectly. Even down to individual lines of dialogue like the gang threatening to castrate Don Corneo and Corneo's whole why does a villain reveal his plan shtick. A few things aren't included, of course, like the satanic ritual you can peek in on in the Honeybee Inn, as well as what I can only assume is a friendly communal bath between Cloud and the boys. Hey, we all get a little sweaty after a good squat, not sure why people would interpret this otherwise, it's uh, clearly wholesome. But then there's also that other room in the Honeybee Inn that's a bit different. You know, the one where Cloud, the main character, the player's controlled character, is casually raped by a guy after passing out. Hey, at least it restored your HP and MP. But yeah, if a few little things like this were lost or changed, well, it's not a big deal because the things that matter the most are still here in all their glory. I've always hated it in YouTube videos when people say, and then this happened, and I was just grinning like an idiot, because it seems like such an overused and annoying expression to me. But then the Demon House boss fight happened, and I'm not sure how else to say this. So, 
Then the Demon House boss fight happened, and there I was, just smiling like a simpleton. I have a set of notes from my last playthrough of the original Final Fantasy VII, where one of them mentions the Demon House as something that would never work in a modern game, and would never actually be in the remake. Oh, how wrong I was. You have to keep in mind here that the Demon House was just one single random encounter enemy you might run into in the Aerith Escort section. It wasn't an important part of the original game, it was just one sort of badly designed enemy in a game full of crazy enemy designs. But it was so weird that it became important to fans over time, and Remake's developers understood this, and not only kept it, but also turned it into a glorious boss fight, which doesn't even feel that out of place. It makes me wonder about Red 13 dressing up as a sailor, or Cloud's adventures with the dolphin. But where once all I felt was vague curiosity over what things Remake would actually remake, now I feel nothing but excitement, and playing this game I was always looking forward to seeing the next big moment that I knew was coming. But even if I was looking forward to these parts, the amount of time in between them was not something I expected. And as much as I do like some parts of Final Fantasy VII Remake, the padding in this game is unbelievable. I haven't read any official reviews for this game, but I assume this is something that every single one of them draws attention to. This feels like such an obvious piece of criticism that part of me feels like it's not even worth going into in much depth, but at the same time it has such a big impact on the game that I feel like I can hardly not go into detail. This game is padded, really padded, and that negatively affects it. And it mostly comes down to one simple thing, which is that the decision to make the game Midgar only was a mistake. In the original game you begin in Midgar, and then will leave after about 6 to 8 hours, with the total game being 40 to 50 hours. However in Remake, leaving Midgar is when the game ends, and this takes 30 to 40 hours. So in the original, Midgar is 15% of the total game, and yet somehow those in charge decided that it was a good idea to stretch this 15% out for the entire game's duration. And while it's true that fitting the whole original story into one modern game might not have been possible, and it's also true that leaving Midgar serves as a sort of end of act one that makes for a nice climax, the original game also had a big moment that would have made for a good endpoint, which is the end of the first disc. You know, the most famous part of the entire game. But instead, we get Midgar only, which means all those great story moments and recreated scenes are spread thin in between hours of unfulfilling busy work. In some parts of the game, Remake adds new content, which ranges from okay to great. Examples of this are the whole of Chapter 4, where we go to Jesse's house, or the expanded wall market section. If the remake had stuck to this approach of just adding lots of new scenes, showing new sides of life in Midgar, or expanding on previously minor details, then this wouldn't have been so bad. It still wouldn't have been the right decision, but it would have been at least tolerable. But instead, 90% of the padding is just slowing down the main story by stretching out the sections between the actually meaningful events. Just look at a breakdown of the original Midgar. This is based off my last playthrough and covers the entirety of this part of the game. You can see that combat sections are broken up with non-combat sections in between, and that no single section lasts more than 40 minutes until you get to the big finale where you're infiltrating Shimra HQ. Important story moments and character development happens in all sections, so no section drags on past its welcome, and the story always keeps moving. The original Final Fantasy VII is a game with great pacing. In fact, in the entirety of the first disc, there isn't a single section that really drags. The longest combat section is probably Shinra HQ, and you're always moving on to new areas with plenty of story integrated into the action. Now, here's an attempt to map the same general structure, again based on my playthrough, but this time for Remake. As you can see, everything takes longer, but some parts are more affected than other parts. Particularly the parts where Remake features side quests, and of particular note, is the section between the Sector 7 plate falling and infiltrating Shimra HQ. This section is 22.5 times as long, and that's a huge increase. 
So, what happens in this section? Well, side quests, an uninteresting underground lab, going back through the sewers, because the sewers are surely interesting enough to warrant a return visit, and also climbing up from the slums to the plate. An event which featured no combat in the original, but now drags on for over one hour, with annoying aerial enemies and unforgettable views. Like this. This background would look bad in a PlayStation 2 game. In 2020, this is just embarrassing. I'm not someone who talks a lot about graphics, and Final Fantasy VII Remake's frequent low resolution textures generally didn't bother me in an otherwise great looking game, but this thing, this pre-rendered abomination, actually offends me on some level. And the rest of this 7 hour 30 minute section isn't much better. In the original you go from the drama of trying to stop the plate falling, to the group's lowest moment where they reflect on their failure in the face of an insurmountable opposition in Shimra, which leads straight into the big assault on Shimra HQ that's given an all or nothing feeling, a moment of defiance, a decision made in direct retaliation and opposition of the plate falling. In Remake, you just wander around a lot, and then go back into the sewers and learn about Leslie's uninteresting backstory. Yay. And by the time you get to Shimmer HQ, the plate falling feels like a lifetime ago, like a completely disconnected event in a plot that's been entirely deflated by all the time wasting. Pacing matters, and Remake fucks this up. Midgar's 6 hour story could be expanded to 10, even 15 hours of gameplay, and it might be fine, but expanding it to 30 to 40 hours is just harmful to the game's previously well paced narrative. When so much else in Remake was done well, this becomes all the more disappointing, and I don't even think that this is a situation dictated by the financial realities of AAA game development. I'm sure Remake was a very expensive game to make and as big as its budget must have been, no budget is limitless. But these filler sections still have new areas, new enemies, new cutscenes, decent boss fights, plenty of voice dialogue, some unique animations, and so on. Outside of the side quests, which are reusing in-game areas, most of the rest of this filler content would have been just as expensive to make as continuing to tell the real story. But even though money has went into these filler sections, they'll still always be brought down by the fact that nothing very interesting can happen in them because they just exist to pad out the real story. When you go to the sewers, the first time, you fight Don Corneo's pet and the group chats about what happens in Wall Market, and then you look for a way out. During this, there are multiple cutscenes that try to add some drama or excitement to a section the developers must know is boring. But here's a challenge for you. There are three cutscenes in the second part of the sewers. What happens in them? I mean, hopefully you've just completed Remake, so this should be fresh in your mind. They should be easy to remember. So anyway, time's up. The answer is some unimportant dialogue that could have just been used to fill silence while exploring, as well as the exciting moment when the group crosses a bridge where Aerith almost doesn't make it. And then, the exciting moment where you cross another bridge which collapses, causing Cloud to almost fall. And then, the big finale where fish guys show up and, oh my god, what's gonna happen? The tension is too much to bear. Oh, the group just leaves. So, did you even remember all of these events? And if you did, did the drama they tried to add have any effect whatsoever? As I said, effort went into these filler sections, and it's such a shame that that effort wasn't spent on something more worthwhile, like telling the game's actual story. In addition to these entire filler chapters, you also have a range of smaller but still noticeable features which all serve to exacerbate the overall pacing problem. Slow walking sections, slow animations when interacting with things, slow menus, cutscenes that could have been normal in-game dialogue, boring side quests where the player tackles such important things as killing local rats and searching for missing cats. This sucks. Then there's things like that part in Hojo's lab where you have to keep swapping materia over when the game keeps forcing you to switch characters, and my god does the speed at which this game moves at times feel glacial. 
These things aren't that important on their own, but they all combine together to slow your progression down, and when combined with a poorly paced story, with entire sections that feel unneeded, it becomes near impossible to view the decision to make the game Midgar only as the correct one. That said, there is one type of filler content that I do think is valuable, which are the mini-games. Mini-games were a big part of the original, and they were often quite simple and quite strange. There aren't many games that take a similar approach, particularly games that are otherwise trying to be cinematic and epic. But while these mini-games weren't that good, they did have a certain charm, and that's only become truer as time went on. There's something so endearing about these sections, precisely because you wouldn't see them in a modern game. And then, along comes Remake, once more staying faithful and proving that actually they can work. It makes me so glad that things like the squat competition are still here, and gameplay-wise these mini-games are much improved to the point where they're actually pretty fun. But they also provide a break from the norm of walking, talking and fighting, making them the only type of filler content that I really enjoyed. So as bad as the pacing and padding can be, I guess Final Fantasy VII Remake is still a big success, and as a remake of the original game, it gets so much right more than I expected. In the intro of this video I talked about faith, the thing that all those screaming fans have which I lacked. The belief that Square Enix do still have it in them, that the remake was a good idea, and that something like this can both be faithful and fun. So I guess what I'm saying is, I was wrong to be so sceptical, and remake made me a believer. The original Final Fantasy VII is a classic, one of the all-time video game greats, and seeing this new version of it in high definition with new scenes is amazing. But this story doesn't stop here. You see, we seem to be living in an era of remakes, and that means something. And in the case of Final Fantasy VII, it turns out that means quite a lot of things. I don't have a problem with remakes, in principle, because unless something goes very wrong, looking at you Blizzard, a remake should not replace the original. The original will still be there, and you'll still be able to play it and enjoy it, and no matter how bad a remake is, it can't take that away from you. And remakes also allow for things which are good to be introduced to new audiences and new generations. When it comes to something like The Lion King, it's hard to understand what the problem with the original movie is, but games are a little different. Final Fantasy VII is about the same age as The Lion King, but whereas The Lion King is still a beautifully animated piece of art, games from that era have sometimes aged less gracefully. So the way Final Fantasy VII looks will be a problem for many people, and I get that. A remake makes sense, financially and otherwise. But a game like Final Fantasy VII Remake isn't made in a vacuum. We seem to be living in an era of remakes, and there are consequences to that. For everything that gets remade or reimagined, brought back from beyond the grave to live on as an immortal icon of pop culture, well, something else never gets a chance to live. And part of me will always dislike remakes because of this. Final Fantasy VII Remake is the game we got instead of Final Fantasy XVI, and Final Fantasy XVI will likely still be made and released one day, but it's not today, and the reason for that is because Square's A-Team made this game instead. And that's an easy thing to reconcile when you're thinking about one single game, particularly one that isn't half bad, but this isn't about one game. This is about society, and we live in a society of remakes, which means originality is more important than ever before. So I guess there's something else we need to talk about here. In case you didn't know, Final Fantasy VII Remake is an incredibly faithful, if padded, game, right up until it isn't. Think of this as a second spoiler warning if you like, because from here on out, it's spoilers all the way down. Anyway, throughout your adventures in Midgar, returning players will notice one thing that isn't so similar, which is the presence of these ghost-like creatures referred to as the Whispers. These show up in a number of scenes where they seem to intervene to prevent certain actions. 
Later on, these are explained by Red 13 as being the arbiters of fate, entities drawn to those who would alter destiny's course. And if you go back and check the times the whispers show up, you'll see this seems true. They act so as to keep the events of the remake in line with the original game. This includes stopping Cloud from killing Reno in the church, injuring Jesse before the second reactor bombing mission to make Cloud go instead, stopping Hojo from telling Cloud about his past too early, and even jumping in to save Barrett's life after he's impaled by Sephiroth. When something goes wrong and an event happens which contradicts or changes the original storyline, the Whispers are there to act as janitors, tidying up anything out of place so that Remake keeps on being the thing it was marketed as, a remake of the original game. However, as the party reaches the end of the game, where you escape from Midgar, things get a whole lot crazier. As Sephiroth turns up, which by the way is something that happens far too often in the remake, seriously all those early fakeout scenes quickly lose all dramatic impact when they happen so often, but here Sephiroth turns up, as he likes to do, the whispers start screaming, and then Sephiroth taunts the party, and then enters a mysterious portal that will lead to a showdown with Destiny itself. You pursue, defeat Destiny, and alter the course of fate forever. It's here the game ends, with the future left as something no longer bound to the events of the first game. Now, anything can happen. To prove this, a flashback shows Zack surviving his previously iconic death, with a poster of a dog which has now changed, suggesting this is a different timeline slash alternative universe. Whether this means Zack has retroactively been brought back to life in the party's timeline, or that the party have now switched timeline, or something else entirely, is deliberately left unclear. The point is this, the future has changed, this is no longer a remake, and nothing is off the table in the next game. And I have to say, I didn't see that coming. I like the interpretation that views the Whispers as the fans, those who want the remake to be as faithful as possible, who oppose all changes and will cry out and maybe even act up when something is changed. Following this view to its logical conclusion, this would make the party's actions at the end of the game a sort of meta-commentary, where the writers are defying fan expectations and taking back control, freeing themselves of the previous restrictions to tell this story exactly the way they want to. And I like this interpretation not because I agree with the whole fuck the fans style debates that seem to happen on the internet every few months, but because if we live in an era of remakes, then there's inherent value to originality, and a game which uses its status as a remake to break free and become its own thing is a great idea, it's an original idea, and this was also one of the biggest surprises for me personally I've ever experienced in a video game. So I love this idea. As an idea, that is. The execution is pretty bad. I think some people might try to defend the whispers on the basis that they don't need to make sense, that that's not the point in them, and if you dislike them then you just don't get it. But I don't think that's true. Final Fantasy VII Remake is telling its own story, and as meta as the whispers might be, that doesn't change the fact that they play a role in Remake's story. And the role they play is inconsistent, contradictory, and overly confusing, which leaves them feeling cheap and as a narrative device, unsatisfying. This was already a story with the will of the planet, and ancients, and aliens, and science experiments, and magic, and materia, and Marco, and mega weapons, and so on. So this was already a story that was reaching its limit in how convoluted things can be before adding in physical manifestations of destiny that are also apparently the will of the planet let alone stepping into the realms of time travel and alternative universes. And all this isn't even a very original concept for a JRPG. I mean, it's only a few years ago that we had an entire trilogy of Final Fantasies with the exact same theme. But even ignoring all this, there are still clear problems. Firstly, if the Whispers are destiny, keeping the game's events on track, then what's causing things to go off track? There's no consistency to the times the whispers show up. 
They stop Cloud killing Reno in the church, but why is Cloud trying to kill Reno? They stop Hojo telling Cloud about his past, but what's made Hojo recognise Cloud now when he didn't in the original game? If the Whispers are a force of destiny keeping things on track, then what force is acting to make things go off track in the first place? It would make more sense if there was some variable or factor causing a divergence from destiny. This could be Aerith, who as an ancient is able to glimpse the future, though I have a problem with that I'll mention later. Or it could be Sephiroth, whose connection to Genova or his position within the life stream makes him immune to the whispers, meaning it's possible for him to change destiny. Or they could take the more meta approach and have the player be the variable, where the whispers show up to stop the player going off script. Like if you try to save Biggs or Jesse, or just go in a direction you're not meant to. This would be harder to pull off with any amount of subtlety, but it would potentially make the party's decision to challenge destiny much more impactful for the player if the player was the one the whispers had been opposing all this time. Instead though, these off-script events that trigger the whispers just happen randomly, and this feels cheap. The whispers also seem inconsistent in their behaviour. Do the whispers act before someone goes off script to keep them on script, or do they tidy things up after someone makes a mistake? Because we see them doing both. For example, Barrett gets stabbed by Sephiroth, which doesn't happen in the original game, so shouldn't the Whispers act to prevent him being stabbed in the first place, rather than just somehow bringing him back from the dead straight afterwards? And then, what about Wedge? Wedge is meant to die when the plate falls, but he doesn't. But then the Whispers try to kill him as the party's escaping Shimmer HQ anyway, so why do they wait until then to intervene? Did the Whispers just forget about Wedge and only remember he's meant to die later on? Or do they just think Wedge is so unimportant that it's fine to let him live another day because he's too useless to change anything anyway? Really, the Whispers seem a little incompetent, which hardly matches their supposed role as manifestations of destiny. And for something like this to work in a story, it needs to come across as carefully thought out and consistent, which it doesn't. And on the topic of not thinking brings through, why does the party decide to fight Destiny? At the end of the game, it's Sephiroth who convinces the party to jump into a portal to another dimension for a showdown with fate. Sephiroth taunts the party to follow him here, so it's clear this is what Sephiroth wants. And what reason does the party have to ever do what Sephiroth wants? At what point does the party decide Destiny is bad in the first place? I mean, think back to the last important thing the Whispers do, which is literally saving Barrett's life. That doesn't make them seem like the bad guys. Red 13 describes the Whispers and the fixed nature of destiny as being the will of the planet itself. But the planet is, more or less, the force of good in this story. I mean, we're fighting Shimra because Shimra are killing the planet, but it's fine for us to go kill the will of the planet. How does that work? Really outside of Aerith, who is more complicated, there's no solid motivation for anyone else to think fighting Destiny is a good idea. Especially not when it's established to be what Sephiroth wants. And on the subject of Aerith, if she does want to alter Destiny, then that's a major retcon from the original game, in which it's later revealed that Aerith had some understanding of the future, and deliberately goes to the Forgotten City knowing she'll die all for the good of the planet. You know, the same planet the party is now basically opposing. So, I like the idea of the Whispers. I like that the remake goes in a different direction. I like things that are meta. And I like the concept of a remake being deliberately misleading in order to be something else. I've seen others complain that this is deceptive and false marketing, and while I understand this perspective, it's not something I have a problem with at all. If anything, I love things like this, and I actually wish more things used deceptive marketing to create more genuine surprises. But I don't think the Whispers are a well-executed idea. And when the Whispers are the original part of this story, and future games will now be going in an original direction, the fact they're poorly handled here feels like a bad sign. 
and I don't want to speculate too much on what this means for the future, because I'd rather not judge something until I've experienced it, but there are other reasons to be worried here. Like how multiple characters have seemingly just been brought back to life, which completely removes so much of the game's emotional and thematic importance. It's one thing to change destiny, meaning a certain character's death becomes no longer set in stone. It's another thing to go full on, no one really dies, and bring previously dead characters back to life. And what about the challenging handling future events now? The next 20 or so hours of the original game are spent slowly travelling around the world in pursuit of Sephiroth, whose legend and presence are built up bit by bit. In the original game we haven't seen Sephiroth yet, and we don't for quite a while. Instead we get these Sephiroth was here moments, with the first being arguably the single greatest moment in the whole of the Midgar part of the game, which is where the party finally gets to the top of the Shinra building, only to quickly be captured and imprisoned by President Shinra. The party is then stuck until you wake up with your jail cell unlocked to find all Shinra personnel dead or missing and this big trail of blood leading from where you previously saw some mysterious entity in Hojo's lab all the way up to the top floor where the president, the guy who easily captured and defeated you, is sitting impaled on a long sword that Cloud recognises as Sephiroth's. And suddenly the game's main antagonist, the president of the most powerful company in the world, is dead just a few hours into the experience, and it's here that you realise, well shit, I guess things are about to get crazy, and they do, without any arbiters of fate or epic sword fights in other dimensions. The original Final Fantasy VII does get crazy, but it waits until the right time, with careful build-up that meant when those big moments do finally come, they truly mean something. But now this can't happen. The stakes have effectively already been shattered with us defeating Destiny itself and having an epic showdown with Sephiroth in an alternative dimension. So being faithful and using the same setup of a slow pursuit with gradual build-up can't really work anymore. So where does this reimagining go from here? The thing is, this is a good game, but the best parts of it were when it was recreating moments from the original. There's a certain irony here in that before playing this game I didn't want a faithful remake, but actually the faithful remake was what I ended up enjoying so much. Final Fantasy VII Remake proved that a remade Final Fantasy VII can work, that this team can pull it off, that there is a way to do it justice. But now that's not what we'll actually get, and who knows what will happen. There's a voice in my head telling me this will end badly, and I think that voice is called logic and evidence and years of experience. There's a voice in my head telling me this is a mistake, that this is exactly the kind of thing I was worried about and this is how the legacy of an all-time classic gets ruined. But, at the same time, I can hardly deny that I am excited, and honestly, I can't wait to see what happens next. And in an era of remakes, this kind of risky move is something I can't help but respect. So I guess there's nothing to do but sit back and enjoy the ride. It's like Barrett always says, there ain't no getting off this train, and I have to admit, it does feel pretty good. The wind in my hair, the not knowing, the endless possibilities. But between you and me, I'm not so sure about the driver. Tetsu Nomura is like a mad genius without the genius parts. There are reasons to have doubts here, many reasons, many sensible, respectable reasons. In fact, if you don't have doubts, you're a fool. But that's the way it is, that's the way it has to be. That is the price of originality, the price of freedom. There's no getting off this train, and I guess we're all just destined to be passengers on Mr. Numara-san's wild ride. And honestly, I don't think the brakes work. And you know, sooner or later that means we're all gonna crash and probably there'll be a great big explosion and screaming fans and new things like Genesis and these three. Ugh. We are all gonna crash, and it will probably be awful. So 
Why do I feel like I did back in 2005? Before the Final Fantasy VII compilation or Final Fantasy XIII dashed my expectations plump fleshy head against reality's unmoving brick wall. This is not going to end well, so why am I excited? I guess that's the difference that faith can make. It can turn you into a believer, even when reason and logic want you to think otherwise. There's no getting off this train. So, I guess I'll see you at the crash site. Choo-choo, motherfuckers. Oh.